Yeah. All right, guys, let's go and get started. So we're going to start out today by going over questions. We can spend the entire period on it, if you so wish, but any questions that Bill might have on the current programming assignment. If we get through that, we're going to look at kind of the classic producer-consumer problem and a few solutions to it. This is something you're going to be going over in lecture on Thursday. Maybe you've touched a little bit of it already, but it's kind of one of those classic problems that we have to look at. Some of what you're dealing with in your current program is related to this problem, although the way we're going to look at it is a little bit different. If we don't get to that, that's fine. Um, we'll start out with any questions on the current assignment. A few items of business. The grading session scheduler is now online for programming assignment two. Make sure you sign up by Monday night. That's also when programming assignment two is due. So essentially, you need to sign up for a grading session by the time you turn in your assignment. If you have any questions about any of that, or if none of the times work for you, you need to contact me and Juno, who is the other TA, just to copy us both, because that's the easiest way for us to work it out. Uh, on an email, get in touch with us one way or another before that sign-up due date. We don't want to hear from anyone next Wednesday that you can't fit in any of the remaining times because you failed to sign up when we told you to sign up. So. Sign up between now and next Monday. If none of the times work, tell us before next Monday. There are a number of sessions during the day on Monday. That's technically before the assignments due. Uh, you, you're not obligated to take those if they're the only ones left, but there are tend to be perks to going earlier rather than later. Partially, I haven't figured out all the mistakes yet, so I can't nail you on them. Um, but if you aren't going to be done until the actual due date and those are the only spots left open, it's also acceptable to email us and tell us you need some other spots. We won't make you grade before the deadline. If you are done and you can't fit in those slots, I would encourage you to take them. Are there questions on the logistics of any of this? If you haven't been paying attention, there's been a number of emails that have gone out to the general post on the Moodle answering various questions related to this assignment. I would peruse those if you're having issues before sending an email of your own because there's a decent chance your question's already been answered. If not, then post there, uh, send us an email. It's probably easier for you to post there. If you send it to me, I will just redact your information and then post it there anyway for everyone else's benefit. So um, that's kind of the way, the most efficient way to ask questions. Logistical questions on anything? Okay. Then let's pause for a sec. And I'll take any questions on programming assignment two that people may have. It's a pretty trick. Wonderful. No questions? There's a few things I'll go over. Uh, yeah, I really hope you have no questions this time because you actually are done. Because if you have no questions because you haven't started yet, you're probably MD, and it's going to be an exciting next four or five days for you. So if you haven't started, you need to have started a couple days ago. And uh, if you have started, hopefully you're well into it. If there aren't any questions, then feel free to jump in. Uh, a few points that have come up that are probably worth mentioning because they're things we haven't really discussed before. The first is the exit condition of your program. So we have a situation where, I mean, we draw this diagram all the time, right? But we have some number of input threads. These are reading your input files, one thread per file, and then they're tossing data into this queue. And then we have essentially our output, our resolver threads. Which are grabbing data from this queue and writing it to our output file. So there are n of these where n is the number of files you have, and there are m of these where m is arbitrary. There's some extra credit for choosing it more or less intelligently in certain cases. But at the end of the day, it can be arbitrary. The issue is, when should our program exit, right? Obviously, our main can't exit right after it spawns all of these, because if it did that, they'd never get a chance to run. We can't exit when our input threads are done because we aren't going to know, um, I mean, our output threads might still be working. We can exit when our resolver threads are done, but that's really just passing the buck because the question is, when's your resolver thread done? Can we assume that when the queue is empty, the resolver threads are all done? You might be able to get away with that, uh, but it's making, if you make that assumption, you're implying that this is always going to be faster than that. That essentially, you're never going to deplete your queue in the fact that these are filling it up. Now, 
Does this happen way faster than this? Probably. It's a lot faster to read from the file than it is to call all of the DNS lookup stuff. But also, if the queue ever fills up, this program spec says that these have to pause for some random amount of time. So you could have the queue fill up. These could pause for a random amount of time. The random amount of time, I think, can go to like up to a second. That's a lot of time. You could have one of these pausing for a second where your resolver threads could empty out the queue in that time. Then your queue would be empty, but you might have an input thread that's not done filling it. So the question becomes, I mean, it really becomes a question of when do we know when the resolver threads are done? So people read my email, you can probably answer this already, but what's the correct exit condition? So how do we know when our resolver threads are done? When the queue is empty and all the requests are threads are done. So we essentially have to keep track of two things. The naive solution would say you just wait till the queue is empty, but that's the wrong answer. And even if you get lucky and your program works in that case, I will grade you down in the grading session if you haven't handled this. Uh, my guess is you probably won't get, especially if you, if you go to the point where you have a bunch of input files, you're not going to get lucky. Um, and having that would actually break your program. So you're right, the, the conditional exit is twofold. Not only does the queue have to be empty, but all of the input threads have to have executed. So how do we know when all of our input threads have exited? Keep a counter. So there's a number of ways you could implement this. You could keep a counter of your input threads, where essentially it gets decremented every time an input thread completes. You then would essentially have to pass a, a reference to that counter to all your resolver threads so that they can test it. Um, counters are fine. They maybe introduce a little bit of extra room for error. The slightly cleaner way to do it might just be to have a global flag uh, or a flag that you pass to those where essentially your main program does a join on all of your input threads, it then sets some flag when that join completes, because that join's gonna not complete till all your input threads are done. When they're all complete, you can set some flag. You pass a reference to that flag to your resolver threads, so essentially your resolver threads can just check that flag. It's essentially the same as a counter, only it focuses all the code in one area instead of distributing each thread. They're both valid solutions. You could maybe argue that the second one's slightly better software engineering just because of grouping but I would take either one. Uh, but you do need some way to essentially detect when your input threads are done. And you then your resolver thread exits when both those things are true. If the queue's empty and your input threads aren't done, you should probably sleep your resolver thread for some random amount of time too and then have it come back and try again. But if the queue gets emptied and the input threads are done, you're good. Don't get so, uh, so involved in setting up this flag that you use it as its load condition. Because if you only test for this flag, you're not done when your input threads are done. If your input threads are done and there's still stuff on the queue, you have to process that too. So it really is the union of these two conditions that have to be satisfied before you can exit. Um, and then your resolver threads can all exit, and then your main program can exit essentially when all your resolver threads have exited, assuming that your resolver threads exit the right place. People clear on that? We haven't really talked about it before. It's kind of subtle if you don't think about it, but the exit condition here is something that you have to think about. It's, it's kind of non-trivial a little bit. Uh, maybe I want to erase this one. So the other thing we have to think about is data storage with respect to our queue. What does our queue store? Pointers. Pointers to what? Uh, to the well, so they're, they're void pointers, I think, is the way I wrote it. Um, we're using them as pointers to but really they're pointers to everything. The queue only stores references. The queue doesn't store any data, it stores references to data. Which means we have a little bit of an issue, again, it's, it's not an inherent, I mean, it's, it's part of the problem, we haven't really talked about it before, but you have the issue of where you actually store all of these host names. When you read a host name out of a file, you're probably reading it inside your input thread, and the very first thing you do is you're probably reading it into some kind of a static buffer. Uh, that's a lot like the way, I mean, maybe you don't do that, but that's how I would start. That's all like the way that the non-threaded example works, right? It reads these into the static buffer. Unlike the non-threaded example, though, we have to keep track of a large number of these at the same time, right? It's whatever we're putting on the queue. We're not just keeping track of one at a time. So you can't simply use that static buffer anymore. If you were passing references to that static buffer to the queue, you're going to get into trouble because everything on the queue is going to point back to the same thing, which is going to change every time. It's not the behavior that you're looking for. At the same time, if you try to go, okay, that's clever. We'll avoid that. Let's just set up a local array inside our input thread and pass references to that to the queue. Well, that's going to get you in trouble because as soon as your input thread exits, that memory goes out of scope. Yet you still have references to that now out of scope memory on your queue. So you can't do that either. You're going to, Valgrind will catch it depending upon 
how the stack works on your machine, you might end up segfault things. If you're lucky, you'll segfault, right? Because at least you know something's wrong. If you're unlucky, you're just going to start reading out of a bunch of memory that is now uninitialized and undefined, and who knows what's going to happen. Um, so the correct way to do this is you're probably, I mean, there are some alternate solutions to this, but the cleanest one, in my humble opinion, is you're going to need to probably use the heap. Meaning that when your input threads, yeah, it's fine to have a static variable that they read out into initially, but you then essentially need to copy from that static variable to some memory on the heap. Meaning you're either going to need, you're going to, need to make a call to malloc either directly or indirectly. Um, if you're going to do this directly and code it all yourself, your input thread reads into the static variable. You then figure out how long it is using like the string length function of that variable. You malloc up enough space plus space with an null terminator. You do a string copy into that space, and then you pass a reference to that space onto the queue. Heap space is not is program scope, right? It's not specific to the thread. So even if your thread exits, anything on the heap is still valid. It's going to stay on the heap. It's a two-edged sword. The fact that this stays on the heap means it's a memory leak unless you free it later. But at least you're not going to go out of scope with it. So you malloc up some space. You put a reference to that in the queue. Like we said, you don't have to worry about freeing, freeing it. So your resolver thread, when it pulls something off the queue, needs to both read it and resolve it. But then it also needs to free that memory space if you're doing this solution. Um, there's a command called strdup, string duplicate is what it stands for. That's part of the POSIX definition for the C standard library, and it exists on Linux. So essentially what strdup does is it, it, it does this for you, right? It calls malloc and string, it calls string link malloc and string copy. So you basically pass it a pointer to a string and it hands you back a pointer to memory space on the heap that now stores a copy of your string. So that's probably the down and dirty, quick and easy way to worry about this. You still have to free that data. There's still a call to malloc hidden inside strdup, but it saves you having to write out the malloc by yourself and at risk making a mistake with forgetting to add or subtract the null terminator in the correct places and stuff like that. The alternate solution to this would be to say not to use the heap would be to use like a big static array stored in main that you then pass a reference to and you basically store everything in your array and your queue then is stored references to your array. Yes, that's a valid solution. Why is it not quite as good as this? Well, in order to do that, you're going to have to impose some kind of fundamental limits. Uh, you're going to, that array is going to be of n size, meaning that if I throw 10,000 input files on you and each one has 10,000 host names in it, you're going to get yourself in trouble. Whereas doing it dynamically, you would be able to handle that case. So it is a solution to do this statically instead of using calls to malloc. You would probably lose at least a few points simply because you're introducing an extra limit that doesn't necessarily need to be there. Um, if you're going to do that, at least do it correctly, right? So, questions on the fact that the queue only stores references and where you might actually put the data that you're referencing. Okay, I think those are kind of the two questions that I've seen pop up a couple of times that are maybe non-obvious and are things we haven't talked about before and that aren't exactly discussed in the PDF. So, you've been told. Any other questions on anything related to this assignment? The, um, when you said handling that um, uh, the resolver threads, I guess the number of resolver threads, are you referring to the extra credit that's already specified on that? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I mean, so the, the assignment says it just has to be two or greater, right? Mm -hmm. But there's extra credit for being a little bit more intelligent in what two and greater actually means. And it's talk, it's okay. the extra credit to talk about the assignment. Okay. Uh, you essentially have two options. You can either match it to the number of cores. Uh, realize it may not be a one-to-one -one match, right? The optimal number might be twice the number of cores. But you can somehow take into account the number of cores, or you can just heuristically determine it by doing some heuristic tests that try to reduce what the ideal number is. Mm -hmm. um, any other questions? But yeah, that's all extra credit. It's not required. The only requirement is you can handle an arbitrary number of mm -hmm. mm -hmm. What were you saying about the cumulative queue size? Um, that like some static uh, size. So same deal. The queue size needs to be, your, your program should basically be able to operate with the queue of any size. For the purposes of early testing, it might make your life easier to make the queue size huge, such that you'll never have a full queue, because it reduces one variable. But that's just like, that would be like developmental. That's, uh, so there might be one point where that's as far as you've gotten. But by the time you're done, you should be able to handle the queue of any size. Um, 
of almost any size. It's spec'd in the doc. I can't remember what I said the minimum size would be. Maybe I said 10. I don't remember what I said. But you should be able to, I should be able to walk into your grading session, go into your code, and set your queue to whatever size oh, I want, okay. and it should work. Okay. You so should not be relying, and the queue should be a black box to some extent. You right. should not be relying on it being a certain size. So we should be testing it in, in all yes. different sizes and make sure it's working. Sure yes. Uh, yeah. I mean, you should do that. Mainly what you should, it's mainly what you should do, right? You should rely on the queue being a specific size. Right. Okay. If you don't do that, it, you should be fine. But as a test, yeah, you should also test it with a couple of different sizes. Other questions? Okay. If there aren't questions, I'll talk to you for a bit. So today what we're going to talk about is kind of the standardized textbook producer-consumer problem and solutions to it. So the way the producer-consumer problem works, I mean, what we're dealing with inside our programming assignment is essentially a subset of it. But it's any problem where you have some kind of thread process, et cetera, right? We're dealing with this in terms of threads, but it would expand to multi-process type programs to distributed systems. It's a, it's a wider program problem. But you have some kind of producer who essentially supplies some form of data to some storage mechanism. Could be a queue, could be a heap, could be, I mean, whatever, right? Um, and then you have a consumer. Could be a buffer, which is actually what we'll be dealing with here. You have a consumer that takes data off this. So we see this kind of a situation a lot. I mean, pretty much any buffer is some kind of producer-consumer problem. That's the point of a buffer. You have something writing to it. You have something pulling from it. These may not be perfectly in sync, and the buffer kind of allows that to grow and expand. But at the end of the day, while these may not need to be perfectly in sync, you generally need to enforce some kind of synchronicity between them. Because, so we dodge this issue a little bit in our program because of the way our queue works, but if this is a buffer, the way most buffers work is they're circular. They never fill up. If you fill it up, you're gonna start overwriting other data. So if this is something like an ethernet card, and this is your packet buffer, if you're not consuming it fast enough, you're going to lose data. Not because you're explicitly dropping it, because your producer's going to fill up the buffer and then start overwriting data that hasn't had a chance to be read yet. So buffers are great. We use them so that it doesn't have to be a one-to-one -one match here, right? They allow kind of some flex between the speed of this and the speed of this, but the net input and output still needs to be the same or we're going to lose something. If this is just fundamentally operates at half the speed of this on average, you're going to lose packets going into this buffer. They have to average the same rates in order for this to work. So the question then becomes, well, how do you kind of enforce some of this stuff? And that's kind of the producer-consumer problem. It's solved for you a little bit. So we have a subset of this in our current assignment, but the fact that the queue in our current assignment blocks both when it's, or has capabilities to tell you when it's full and tell you when it's empty is kind of how we avoid this, right? We don't have a queue that if you just keep bombarding, you're going to start overwriting stuff. If you keep bombarding it, it's going to fill up and it's going to start telling you it's full and then you have to interpret that, but it's not really going to let you break it per se. So it's still a producer-consumer problem, but it's a little bit, this the case where you can fill up and overwrite data is a little bit more of a nuanced one and that's what we're going to be looking at. So we're going to kind of take an innovative approach to a couple of different solutions to this problem. And We'll start by looking at more or less the trivial solution, just to give you guys some familiarity with exactly what we do. So we have a program, and essentially what it does is spawns a single producer thread and a single consumer thread. So it has two active threads, plus there's always mains of the thread, right? So there's a third thread that's kind of just paying attention to things, but isn't really involved in the whole process. We have a buffer of size one. So in this case, we essentially have a buffer. It's the simplest buffer we can have. It can store exactly one object at a time. Uh, mainly for simplicity, there's nothing inherent about the one object. You can expand this to 10 objects. You would have to adopt the code uh, to, to handle that. But we have a buffer that essentially can hold a single object at any given time. That buffer is just implemented as the struct. The one object is just an int. So we have a buffer that can essentially hold one int at a time. Right? Very simple buffer, buffer of size equals one. I'm going to skip over these structs for a sec, but we'll come back to them. 
our buffer has three operations on it. It has an initialize operation that just sets it to some known value, in this case, negative one. We have a put, which takes as an argument some buffer and some item. It then sets that the, the buffer equal to that item. And then we have a get, which returns whatever the buffer is currently stored. People okay on what the buffer does or how it works? We then have these producer and consumer functions. Well, I guess I can talk to them now. So we'll come back in more detail, but the bulk of it is each of these goes through this for loop that goes from zero to some number of cycles. This is defined as 10 up at the top right now. So essentially we run this loop 10 times. Each time we put the current iteration of the loop as the integer onto the buffer. So we essentially write the integer zero through nine to the buffer. Our consumer then does the exact opposite of that, loops through the same number of times, and consumes 10 items from the buffer, printing them to the screen each time. Our main statement then kind of sets up some of these local variables we need, and again, I'll, I'll stop and go through this line by line in a sec. Sets up this mutex that we're currently using, sets up our buffer, creates our consumer thread, creates our producer thread, waits for our consumer thread, waits for our producer thread, and then exits. So the essential goal is, we, we will assume, I guess the program doesn't apply this, but we'll assume the goal is for all 10 items that the producer writes to the buffer to essentially be read by the consumer, right? Assume these are network packets or something. And the producer is generating 10 items and we would like the consumer to get all 10 of those at some point. Now, does this do this right now? Well, not exactly, and we'll get into that, but essentially that's what we're looking at. It's a program that writes the number zero to nine to the buffer and it's working correctly, the consumer then gets the number zero to nine at the screen. Are people clear on that? All right, so let's go into some of the detail of exactly what's going on here. So in addition to defining this buffer type, we define two structs, producer args and consumer args, where these structs are essentially what we're gonna pass to our producer and consumer threads. This is how we're passing arguments to our threads, like we talked about last week. They provide that void star pointer. We are going to pass references to these two objects as that void star pointer. This essentially represents what we're going to pass to each thread. I separated it into two. In reality, in this code, our producer and our consumer actually need the exact same arguments. So we could reduce this to one and just call it args. Uh, but they're separated in my case. In your current program, you probably need two of these, right? Because your producer being what's reading the files and your consumer being what's actually doing the lookups are different enough that they're probably going to need access to different types of data. In this case, it's a pretty simple program. They both need access to the same type of data. What data are we giving them access to? Well, we're giving them access to this common buffer, or to a reference, again, it's a pointer. So we're giving them access to a reference to this buffer, and then we're giving them access to this region mutex, where the goal of this mutex is just, just like in our other program, we don't want to be reading from the buffer in some non-deterministic state where we're also writing to it simultaneously. So this mutex basically just ensures that only one thing can ever operate at the buffer on it, operate on the buffer at a time. Are we good with that? So then we get down into what our let's step through the producer and consumer code. So just like before, this is just the standard function prototype that we have to use. We pass it this void star. I just called it args. We can pass it anything. What are we passing it? Well, we know we're passing it this producer args t struct. So the very first thing we do is resolve this void star pointer by creating a local variable of a known type. Remember, you have to do this because you can't operate on void star pointers directly. The system doesn't know what to do with them. So create something of a known type. We then set it equal to that void star pointer. Like we talked about last week, this is pretty C specific. It's not type safe, which is the downside to it, but this is kind of how you do generalized uh, OO type stuff in a C word. It allows us to pass anything and then interpret it as a specific type. We then set up this int i, that's just our counter integer that we use in our for loop. We have a little printf statement just so we can kind of keep track of what's going on. This prints as soon as this thread starts, more or less. We then get into our body loop. We attempt to take out a lock on the buffer, assuming we can secure that lock, meaning that no one else is using the buffer right now. We write the value of i to the buffer, where again, the buffer is something that got passed in in those arguments. Uh, the reference to the mutex also got passed into the arguments. We then print out what we just wrote. We do a flush. This just ensures that the printed statement actually gets printed to the screen right away. We're kind of bypassing the buffering system. If you're trying to do, if you're trying to use print statements to troubleshoot things like threads, you probably also want to be flushing them. 
because when you just print a standard out, there's some buffering, there's some buffering in between. When it actually gets printed to the screen might not be when you call that print out. F flush ensures that it will get printed to the screen when you call that flush. So this is just to make our output look like we expect it to look out. And be aware, don't get hung up troubleshooting things that aren't actually issues that are just side effects of the buffering of standard out. The other way you can get around this is if you use standard error. Standard out is line buffered. Standard error is character buffered. So standard error tends to print to the screen much faster than standard out does. Um, that's an aside for future troubleshooting. We then check our lock back in and repeat the loop. When the loop's done repeating, we exit this. What does our consumer program do? Well, essentially the same thing. It casts its consumer arcs to the correct type. I mean, it's, it's, it's uh, implicit cast instead of explicit cast, which is good. Um, we then go through our 10 times. Again, we try to take out a lock. If we can get a lock, we read whatever's currently in the buffer. We print it to the screen. We flush it, and then we check our lock back in. So they both do pretty much the same thing. I can go over it. Is everyone kind of comfortable with how we're passing arguments to these? Is this clear? I know we talked about it a little bit last week, but it takes some getting used to it. Yeah, it's it. So it'll become clear when we look at main here in a sec. But let's look at what we're actually doing in main. Well, what do we do? We create a handle to our producer thread, just like we talked about last week. We create an instance of our producer thread argument struct. We create a handle to our consumer thread, and we create an instance of our consumer thread struct. We create a reference for this pthread mutex that we have to keep track of, and we create an instance of our buffer. So we may have touched on a little bit last week, and I think you've seen it in classes, but the pthread mutex is just the pthread implementation of the mutex, where mutex is a binary semaphore. It's some object that can be checked out, by, but only by one, only one instance that can be checked out at a time. Where you can only check out only one thing and have it checked out at a time is probably the better way to think about it. So by itself, mutexes don't really do anything. They have two operations on them other than the init. They have lock and unlock. They have some other operations for non-locking behavior, but the core operations in a mutex is essentially lock and unlock, sometimes called check-in or check-out, where lock is essentially, if the mutex is currently unlocked and you call lock, it'll allow you to lock it. You will then be the only person that's allowed to unlock it. And that mutex will stay locked until you unlock it. If you go to lock it and it's currently locked, depending upon the implementation, in this case called lock, uh, your program will wait until it can take out a lock or else it will return an error. Same is true if you try to unlock it and you're not the person that has it locked, you'll get an error. If you try to unlock it and you are the person that has it locked, it'll then be unlocked and someone else will check it out. So by itself, it doesn't really do anything, but we can use this property that only one thing can have it checked out at a time to kind of enforce control flow in other parts of our code. So we, to start out with this mutex, you have to call this pthread mutex init function. This is just, you can look up the man pages on all of this, and I'll release this code later. But this is just a function that essentially, and it, uh, essentially um, initiates our, initializes our pointer, or our, initializes our reference to this mutex here. Again, there's some arguments you can pass it, just like in pthread by passing it null, where it's asking for kind of the default configuration. It can return an error, we catch it so. Once we have, once we've initialized our mutex, we then need to set up the references to it that we're actually going to end up passing to both of our threads. So both in our producer and our consumer args thread arg struct, they both have these members called region mutex. Both those point to the same mutex. So our mutex is actually being stored here in main, but we are passing references to it to our threads. You don't generally allocate any memory in your threads directly because of scoping issues, right? I mean. If you allocate it in your thread, it's only available to your thread, it's not available to anyone else. That's generally not what you're going for. Um, so instead, we initialize everything inside our main program here. That's where the data actually is. That's where it's scoped. Our threads just have references back to that data. So although we have two separate arguments, two separate structs here, both those structs are pointing to the same thing. So this region mutex is only one mutex. Whether we're referring to it from the consumer or the producer, those are all pointing back to the same single mutex stored inside our main. People okay with that? So then we go ahead and same deal. We call our initialize our buffer and we set up references to our buffer in, in both of the structs that we are then going to be passing to our threads. Real quick question. Would it be frowned upon to use a global variable? So yes, it's always frowned upon to use global variables, right? <laughs> um, 
in this case, you need to use the global variable, you still have to do, well, yeah, if you use the global variable, you could avoid having to do this. But this would be the preferred method to do it because it's a little bit more controlled than using the global variable. Um, in a way, these are global variables, right? They're just not, they're, they're in our main namespace, meaning that anything can access them as long as we give them the appropriate reference to do so. Um, they're going to exist as long as the program exists. They behave a lot like global variables. There's actually an implementation of this online that uses global variables, and I converted it to do this because this is a little bit classier. <coughs> so could you use a global variable? Yes. Would it be frowned upon? Probably. Uh, there are times and places, but generally you stay away from global variables. Um, I guess a question I had in reference to uh, PA2, um, would it be okay to use global variables in, in I mean, yeah, again, it would probably be better if you didn't. Are you going to not get any credit if you do? No. Uh, you might lose a point or two in the style section, but if your program works correctly using global variables, it's an acceptable solution. It's probably not the best solution, which is why you might lose a few style points, but it's it's not going to make or break your grade. You're talking a few point stops. Um, but in general, the better solution would be to avoid the global variables when possible. Especially if you get into situations, so where global variables can get dangerous is if you have multiple instances of the program running at once, especially if they're static global variables. Um, because then if I ran this, ran two instances of this program on the same computer with a static global variable, they're going to interact and it's going to unfine behavior. Stay away from global variables when you can. If you're using them, know that they're a little bit dangerous and it's probably not the best solution, but it is a solution. Anything else? All right. If you need examples of how not to use global variables, you're looking at it here, right? So I'll release this code later. It's a little bit more work because you got to keep track of more references, but at the end of the day, it's a little bit cleaner. After we set up our buffer and set up our references to it, we then go ahead and spawn both of our consumer and producer threads, just like before. Passing this null means we just kind of want the default set of options. We then tell it these are the names of the functions that each one's going to run, and we pass a reference to these uh, to these structs that contain references to all the data that we need access to. We then come down, like I said before, we wait on both our threads. Again, we don't really care what they return. Having a null here means we're just throwing out their return values. That's what would be there. And then the program as a whole exits. So is everyone clear with what this does? Can anyone tell me what's wrong with it? Yeah, you haven't, um, you haven't, I shouldn't say free the mutex, but you haven't Disable the mutex, I guess, after the end of the program. So I haven't, but you don't explicitly need it. That's not really the issue. Um, I wonder if I, I didn't actually check if I remember really. That you're right, I might need to call. That might be a issue, but that's not the primary issue. What's this program going to do when we run it? Are we going to get this behavior where all 10 items of the producer producers get consumed or not? Uh, you have no control over. When the producer is putting in, when the consumer is grabbing. So your producer can produce all ten times, and then your consumer can grab that last one ten times, and that's still a very good data. Exactly. Uh, as the program's written now, we're protecting our queue, right? We're ensuring that no two things are accessing at once. But we're not doing anything to enforce the fact that since our buffer is only of size one, we need to make sure that every item the producer produces is matched by a consumer action before we produce another item. Let's go ahead and run it and see what happens in its current state. So if we compile it, Where are the compiler commands, the one you guys should have seen before? We're just calling GCC with all of our warnings turned on. That's what the dash w all and dash w extra do. It's a p thread program, so you have to remember to include this dash p thread. We want our output file to be in PC1, and then the last thing we pass is just the name of our input file. So if we run this, we get no output. That's a good thing. So let's go ahead and run the program we just compiled. It's the green one up there. And if we run it, let me run it again and pipe it into less since it doesn't quite fit on the screen. So if we run this, we get more or less the behavior you were describing, where we start both of our threads, 
but then our consumer runs all 10 times before our producer actually produces anything. So what our producer is producing is never actually getting passed to our consumer. Our consumer is just reading the empty queue, which is what that negative one value is indicating 10 times and then exiting. This is also non-deterministic. If we do this a couple of times, we get the opposite behavior too, right? So you generally see one of these two cases. It could interleave itself some. It's beyond our control. It's up to the system scheduler. But in this case, our producer runs first. It actually manages to produce all 10 times, but then the consumer doesn't start consuming until the end of it, so it just reads that last item out all 10 times. People will kind of see what the issue is. So what we need to do is come up with a solution that enforces so again, we're using a buffer of size of one, so this might seem a little bit trivial. In real life, you would probably insource this. So, so just that every five things that got produced, the consumer would have to consume at least one, right, if it was of size five. But for our case, they have to be answered one to one, which some would say defeats the purpose of the buffer altogether, does it? Yes. But for the sake of demonstration, realize that you could expand the solution to a buffer bigger than size one, which is where it would actually start to make more sense. So let's go ahead and look at a version of this program that deals with this. So I'll just quickly take you guys through the changes. This is a copy of the last program we looked at with a few changes. So most of this code is identical. We still have the same buffer. We still have the same buffer functions. What's changed? Well, uh, mainly because I'm looking at the wrong one. Let's try that again. This one's really similar. Um, <laughs> so we have the same buffer that we had before. It has the same buffer operations. But now, instead of passing that new text to the function, we're using this int variable called turn. Where essentially, we're implementing a solution where we have this extra variable called turn. And the rule is, when turns equal to 0, it means that our producer can do its thing. When turns equal to anything non-zero, it means that our consumer can do its thing. The producer can't run its code when it turns non-zero, just like the consumer can't run its code when turn is zero. So we're passing references to this variable term. I'll come back to how we actually handle it, producer and consumer. Let's just look at the main. So because we're using turn to enforce one running and then the other, and because we only have one of each, we don't really need that mutex anymore, right? The fact that only one thing, the fact that they have to alternate is going to, as a side effect, guarantee that only one's ever accessing the buffer at once, right? So we pulled out that mutex that used to be typed in the buffer. It's not strictly necessary in this case because the nature of alternating, as long as you only have one producer and one consumer, guarantees that only one thing will ever have an opportunity to access the queue at once. So we set up our turn variable. We're going to start out with an equal to zero. Why would we want to start with an equal to zero? We need our producer to produce before we can consume anything, right? The producer, if we're going to do this alternation, the producer has to start the alternating because we need to produce something before we can consume it. So starting out with it zero is going to ensure that our producer happens first. Just like before, we set up the references in the appropriate structs. We initialize the sub references to our buffer. We spawn both our threads. We wait on both our threads, and then we return. So how do we actually use this turn variable to enforce this? Let's look at the producer code first. So Code does essentially the same thing as before. We deal with our void star pointer. We print out the same thing. We enter this for loop that's going to execute n times. But now the very first thing we do in the for loop is we essentially call what's a busy while loop, right? So while loop, the semicolon at the end, it has no body. All that this while loop does is it's just going to spin until the condition that the while loop's looking for is equal to false, at which point it's going to allow this code to proceed. But essentially, this busy while loop here means that our program is going to sit right here until some condition occurs. And it's not going to proceed past this point until that condition occurs. So what condition are we looking for? Well, we are looking at the value of this turn integer. Remember, it's a pointer, so we have to dereference it. In C, remember that any zero value is going to be interpreted as false. Any non-zero value is going to be interpreted as true. So this while loop is essentially going to, if, if whatever this is inside here, so turn is equal to zero, the while loop's going to exit, and we're going to run this code. If turn is a non-zero value, the while loop's going to sit here until turn switches to a zero value. So when we start out the program, turn's equal to zero, we're going to hit this while loop. This condition's immediately going to fail. We're going to fall right through the while loop. We're then going to go ahead and put our first item on the buffer, do our print statement, do our flush. Then we set that variable equal, we set our return variable equal to a one. By setting it equal to a one, we ensure that when we come back to throw this for loop, turns now one, we're going to set this while loop. If this were the only thing running, we'd set this while loop forever. 
because it doesn't change it again. We will assume that the consumer takes care of switching that one back to a zero, which will then let us execute this again, so on and so forth. So if we look at our consumer code, what does it do? Well, kind of the exact opposite. So it has the exact same test, only it puts logical not in front of it. So this literally is the inverse case of what's above. So any time that this is a non-zero value, this while loop's going to fail. It's going to come through here, run the consumer code. It's then going to set it equal to zero, loop back around. When it's zero, it'll be stuck on this while loop until something else switches it to a non-zero value. So essentially, each of these wait for the turn variable to be equal to their respective value. They then go through, do their thing, and then they set the turn variable equal to the other one's value, which is going to enforce this alternating back and forth. People see how this works? So let's go ahead and run this code. Compile and run this code. And if we now run it and pipe the output to less, We get the output that we were looking at before, where there's still a non-determinism as to when each one starts, but the reading is now deterministic. So we guarantee that our producer is the first thing to put, then our consumer grabs one, our producer puts one, our consumer grabs one, so on and so forth. We are now actually seeing the behavior that we were expecting to get before, but didn't really account for. This turn variable is essentially enforcing this alternating nature between our, uh, between our producer and our consumer. People okay with this? So what's the problem with this implementation, though? Or is there one? Assignments aren't atomic. Yes, and there's kind of another. So that's the subtle problem. There's, um, there's another problem with it. What did you say? There's a lot of downtime. Uh, what do you mean by that? Your processor is just speeding after you do one put or 20 gig. Right. So that's kind of the big one, a little less subtle one. Um, Light global variables, busy while loops, don't tend to be the best way of doing things. This is essentially going to run your processor as fast as it can doing this comparison over and over again. Which, can you get away with it on today's computers? Yeah. But um, you don't want to, right? You're just you're wasting electricity, if nothing else. So there are better ways of doing this, uh, which is what we're going to look at in the next solution. The other thing you said is also true. I didn't actually sit down and solve out whether or not it would be a problem in this case, but it is something you want to be attuned to. This is a non-atomic operation. Uh, or more importantly, this is a non-atomic operation. So do people know what we mean when we say atomic or refer to atomicity? So quick recap, what we basically say when we say a block of code is atomic, it means that we're asking for the guarantee or we're providing the guarantee that that code will either exit, that block of code will either execute to completion without being interrupted, or it'll fail. It'll never be in an intermediate state, right? It'll either be failed or it'll be run to completion and working correctly. It doesn't allow it to be halfway complete ever, right? Or partially complete, which is a property you often want. This assignment here probably turns into four or five commands in a similar language if you actually looked at the compiled output of this. Keep in mind, between each command, the operating system could interrupt and go start working on the other thread. So, Again, I don't know that it actually matters in this case because it's a pretty simple right. singular assignment. And if you, it would only matter if you had multiple producers. Right. If you have multiple producers, it's definitely going to be an issue um, because you would essentially get into a case where this could be this test. It could be doing this test while it's writing this variable, which could lead to some non-deterministic behavior. So, lack of atomicity is the subtle issue. It's something you should definitely be thinking about if you ever implement a solution like this with one producer and one consumer. I think you can get away with it. Um, but the problem exists. More importantly, we're just spinning our processor here, and that's not great. So we're running out of time, but let's quickly look at a solution that avoids this issue. So this solution, instead of using that turn variable, goes back to using mutexes again. But this time we use two mutexes, where essentially we have, what's, we have a producer mutex and we have this consumer mutex. Where the rules basically are, if the producer mutex is locked, the producer can't do anything. The producer can only run, can only start to run when the producer mutex is unlocked. Consumer mutex does the same thing. If the producer, if the consumer mutex is unlocked, then the consumer code can start to run. 
So essentially, each of these corresponds to allowing that set of code to run. So same deal as before, we put copies of them in the arguments we're passing. In our main statement, we now have to initialize both of them. This is essentially the same thing we did before. We do have an initial condition we have to pay attention to. We start out, again, with the producer mutex unlocked and the consumer mutex locked. Why? Well, same reason we started out with turn equal to zero before. We want to make sure our producer runs as the first step before the consumer runs. So this is essentially the same code from the first program and initializing mutex of the references with the addition of the initial condition being the consumer mutex is locked, the producer mutex is unlocked. If we then look at how these actually get used, so similar to what we did before, only now we've pulled out our busy while loop. Instead of that busy while loop, we try to take out a lock to this produce mutex. If it's unlocked, this will succeed and allow us to run our code. We will then, when we're done running our code, we're going to unlock the consumer mutex because we just put something on the queue. By unlocking this, we're essentially sending a signal to the consumer that it can now run. When we recycle back to the beginning, we're going to get blocked at this lock because we locked it when we did it the first time. It's still locked when we recycle. We're going to block here until something else unlocks it. What does the consumer do? Well, the reciprocal again. It's going to go ahead and, oh, and I have this set up right now for to demonstrate that lock. But um, it's going to go through. It's going to try to take out a lock on the consume index. When this first starts running, the very first time, it's going to block here until the producer has a chance to run. Because as we saw in our initialization, the, 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 mute, the consume mutex starts out as being locked. So it'll block here until we unlock it at the end of the first run of the producer. This being unlocked allows us to run this code. Same deal again. We then unlock the producer, allowing us to put another one on, recycle back to the beginning, and then we're blocked here until that producer finishes a second time. So same deal as before, we're enforcing this back and forth, but by using mutexes, one, I mean, I guess we're kind of at the whim of where we're implementing pthread mutex, right? But we're making the assumption that pthread mutex lock is implemented in a manner more efficient than a busy while loop, and the pthread mutex functions have guaranteed atomicity. So we are ensuring that things will not get interrupted during these functions, uh, which if you had multiple copies of this would avoid some of that non-deterministic behavior you might see. So if we look at this and compile it, and then run it, We get essentially the same behavior we saw before, only it's a slightly more robust implementation. So the output's the same as before. It, it accomplishes the same thing as using that turn variable, but it accomplishes it in a slightly more efficient and certainly more robust in terms of atomicity manner. Questions on that? So that's kind of the basics of the producer-consumer problem. Again, we were solving all of these with a buffer size of one, but you could scale this up. If you had a buffer size of five, you would just, instead of ensuring that it was a one-to-one -one coordination, you would set up the system to ensure that for every five productions, you have to have at least one consumption, right? So in that case, instead of using mutexes, you'd probably switch to something like semaphores, which work like mutexes, but instead of having one thing checked out, you can check them out multiple times, uh, which would allow you to match up to the size of the buffer a little bit closer. There's some other problems and things we still don't really talk about is the concept of deadlock. Uh, that's something you're going to get into some on Thursday. You might look at it some next week. For now, I'll post this code online later. Make sure you schedule your grading sessions. If you have any questions that you're going to email us, email us at least 48 hours before the due date, right? Don't expect to email me 5 o'clock on Monday and get an answer before the due date. Thanks a lot, guys. Good luck finishing up the assignment this week.